Antarctica was always on my bucket list. Been to all the other continents, and it's not something I would arrange myself, but I got a phone call. For Neil deGrasse Tyson, Antarctica wasn't just a place. It was the one ghost still haunting his bucket list. All seven continents. All but one. And let's be real. Antarctica isn't something you book like a trip to Paris. Well, his dream was unique, but seemed unapproachable. But where there is a will, there is a way. Because one day, Neil's phone rang, and he was given an unexpected invitation from Future of Space, an organization that explores oceans, skies, and the unknown. They weren't planning a cruise. This was a mission. So, would Neil come aboard? Let's get deeper into this mission to get the answers. Imagine that the passage was covered. All expenses. All Neil had to do was show up, share a few talks, and spend time with people hungry for the unknown. How could he say no? This wasn't just tourism. It was exploration with purpose. So, yes, Antarctica was finally crossed off his list. But this wasn't your typical bucket list moment. Because on the journey south, toward a frozen frontier that has seen more mystery than humanity, something strange hangs in the air. It's not just the cold. It's mortality. There's a quiet understanding on board the ship that everyone will die. Eventually. Inevitably. Someday. But that truth feels a little closer when you're drifting through icebergs, suspended between nowhere and never. And maybe that's part of the draw, standing face to face with a planet that doesn't care whether you survive it. Neil wasn't the only one on board who brought a little star power. At 93 years old, William Shatner still had that spark, the only one among them who had gone where no one had before. Then there was Scott Kelly, an astronaut and the American record holder who spent the longest time in space. Neil brought his wife and his son, Travis, who never left his stateroom without a GoPro. Travis captured the heartbeat of the journey. Most of what was documented, those moments frozen in time, came through Travis's lens. They flew from Buenos Aires, Argentina, to the southernmost city in the world. Think about that for a second. Ushuaia. Just pronouncing it feels like crossing a border. This coastal town, snug at the edge of Patagonia, isn't just a stopover. It's the gateway to Earth's final chapter. And honestly, Neil had no idea it was even a real place. Ushuaia sounded more like a shampoo brand than a port city. But there it was, vibrant, rugged, and fully aware of its role in history. This was the end of the road for civilization and the beginning of something else entirely. From there, the ship pointed south. But to get to Antarctica, you must first cross something else, Drake's Passage. Now, think about this. The water between Ushuaia and the northernmost tip of the Antarctic Peninsula. A turbulent gateway where the Atlantic and Pacific Oceans collide. And when do two oceans meet? They don't exactly shake hands. They crash. Is it just the geography that makes it so choppy? Or is there some deeper, elemental clash beneath the waves? The planet's pulse may speed up there. Neil, a city kid born under fluorescent lights, had read about Drake's passage. But nothing prepares you for the raw violence of it. Because crossing into Antarctica isn't just a change of location. It's a confrontation with nature with silence, with yourself. So, when you are ready to confront this reality, picture this from Neil deGrasse Tyson's perspective. He's standing on a ship deck, staring out at the horizon, but the horizon isn't staying still. It tilts left, then it swings right. But it's not the sky moving, it's the boat. And it's doing things no boat should ever be doing on purpose. Welcome to Drake's Passage, 
that brutal stretch of ocean between the southern tip of South America and the frozen gates of Antarctica. It's not just rough water. It's a test. Neil didn't eat much during the crossing. Truth be told, no one did. Plates slid off tables like gravity forgot how to work. Chairs creaked. The hallways rocked. The sea tossed the ship so intensely that it felt like Earth was trying to shake the passengers loose. There's a moment, somewhere in the middle of that crossing, where silence falls over the ship. Not the peaceful kind, the heavy kind. Everyone's tucked away in their rooms. The halls go quiet. Not out of fear, exactly, but out of respect for the sea, for the crossing, for what's coming next. And here's the kicker. This was a modern vessel, barely five years old. Stabilizers, reinforced hulls, all the tech you'd want in a ship that dares to brave the Southern Ocean. Now, think back. What about the 18th or 19th century explorers? The ones who ventured out in wooden ships had none of the advantages modern science provides. If this was what it felt like on a 21st century craft, what did they go through? What kind of courage or madness drives someone to set sail into that chaos with only canvas and prayer to hold them steady? And yet, they did it. Neil couldn't help but let that thought sit with him for a while. Surviving Drake's passage isn't just about holding your stomach or balancing your plate. It's about confronting something ancient, untamed, and indifferent to your presence. It makes you feel small, and somehow, even more alive. But not everything was stormy and silent. Once things calmed down, Neil found some joy in conversations with others on board, fellow explorers in their own right, people who, like him, were there not just to see Antarctica, but to feel it, to wrestle with it, and to leave changed. One of those moments became special, a Star Talk live session recorded on the ship. His guests were none other than William Shatner and astronaut Scott Kelly. Yes, that's Scott Kelly, the twin astronaut who lived in space long enough to start diverging biologically from his brother. It was one of those surreal, cosmic, full-circle moments, standing at the edge of the Earth, talking about space with people who had been there. Whether it's the vacuum of orbit or the violence of Drake's passage, one truth remains. The universe doesn't wait for you to be ready. It just dares you to show up. For Neil deGrasse Tyson, conversations about space never really stay in space. They drift, echo, and expand into something bigger, something human. On board that Antarctica voyage, he recorded an episode of Star Talk Live that felt more like a moment than a show. One of the guests? Scott Kelly. You know, the astronaut who spent almost one year in orbit aboard the International Space Station. That's not just endurance. It's a whole redefinition of what it means to live off Earth. And when someone has been up there for that long, you listen, carefully. They talked about exploration and discovery in space and here on Earth, particularly at the farthest edges. Antarctica and outer space, on the surface, they couldn't be more different. But at their core, they're the same story told in different settings. Both are brutally hostile. Both are unforgiving and both dare the human spirit to keep going long after comfort has passed. Think about it. For the explorers who first reached Antarctica, coming from European cities and warm, stable climates, what must it have felt like to step foot into a world so indifferent, empty, and cold that even breathing felt like defiance? Now, in contrast to the early days of space exploration, rockets. Silence the unknown. What kind of bravery did it take to climb inside a metal capsule, strap into an explosion, and hope the math was right? What kind of belief in science, what kind of sheer audacity does that require? William Shatner, also on board, 
seemed especially drawn to these ideas. Exploration, to him, wasn't just a profession. It was a lens through which we understood ourselves, our past, our future, our very reason for being here. As Neil put it later, we're not just dreamers, we're wired for curiosity. That's how we got here. That's how we survive. And then, in one of those full-circle moments, Neil sat down for another conversation with Charlie Duke, an Apollo astronaut, one of the few people who've walked on the moon, a quarter of a million miles away, and he's been there. The timing was no accident. They spoke on Christmas Eve. Because on Christmas Eve of the year 1968, something extraordinary happened. Apollo 8 became the first human crewed mission to reach the moon. They didn't land, but they orbited it. And as they came around the far side, cut off from Earth's signals, floating in silence, they saw something no human had ever seen. Earthrise. That iconic photograph? A fragile blue marble suspended over the gray, lifeless horizon of the moon. It wasn't just beautiful. It was humbling. And from a quarter of a million miles away, those three astronauts read the opening verses of Genesis aloud. Not because it was planned, but because sometimes the silence is so vast, the only thing that fits is something ancient and sacred. In the beginning, Neil wanted to talk to Charlie about that moment, about what it meant, about how it changes a person to see Earth not as a place under your feet, but as a fragile, floating speck in the dark. Fewer than 30 people in history have had that view, and fewer still have spoken about it with the kind of quiet awe that Charlie did. And yet, amid all the space talk, the Antarctic wasn't done making itself known. Brian Greene, another Star Talk favorite and a fellow physicist, was there too, with his wife and two kids. Turns out, it wasn't his first trip to Antarctica. Second time, he said. Though Neil jokingly noted that just meant he had twice the chances to get seasick. But even physicists bundle up. Antarctica, in December, which is technically summer there, can still bite. The mercury hovered around the mid-30s Fahrenheit, maybe just below zero Celsius on colder days. And funny enough, New York City, where Neil lives, was colder that same week. Go figure. But numbers aside, the cold in Antarctica isn't just physical. It's emotional. It's existential. This cold doesn't just sting. It strips away every ounce of comfort you thought you packed. No matter how many layers you're wearing or how advanced your gear is, the cold wins when you're exposed for too long. It always does. And it's not just the temperature. It's the wind. That biting, relentless wind turns 35 degrees into something more brutal. Something personal. That's why, before anyone sets foot on the ice, they suit up like they're preparing for battle. Not against an enemy but against nature itself. Everyone, including me, was issued a big, puffy, canary-yellow parka. Not exactly fashion-forward, but in the face of Antarctica's fury, it was armor. Beneath that, multiple layers of thermals, waterproof pants, and gloves so thick you could barely move your fingers. All of it is necessary. Because in that part of the world, survival isn't a given. It's a process. We were gearing up for Elephant Island, a name that sounds oddly playful for a place steeped in historical hardship. But before we could even step off the ship, there was a checklist, one that had less to do with us and more to do with protecting Antarctica from, well, us. Most people don't realize this, but our clothing, even our Velcro, can carry microscopic stowaways, dirt, Seeds, microbes, things so small they slip past sight, but not past consequence. Antarctica is one of the last truly untouched places on Earth. If a rogue bacterium hitched a ride in the fold of someone's jacket 
and made landfall, it could throw off an entire ecosystem in delicate balance for millions of years. So yes, we had to pass inspection. Our boots were scrubbed. Our gear was checked. Not once, not twice, but obsessively. Now picture this. A group of humans, bundled like marshmallows, stepping cautiously onto ancient ice. The silence is deafening. There's no hum of a city, no buzz of insects, just the occasional whisper of wind sweeping across a vast white emptiness. And suddenly, someone's holding a piece of glacier in their hands. It wasn't just frozen water. It was time. A piece of earth carved by the past, preserved in temperatures so low it's as if history itself was trapped inside. Holding it. It felt like touching something sacred. And oddly enough, it looked like art. Crystal clear. Elegantly fractured. Like nature crafted it on purpose. But the beauty of Antarctica is deceptive. It lures you in with its breathtaking landscapes, then reminds you with every step that this place is not meant for humans. It's a place of extremes, and nothing reminds you of that more than the icebergs. Now, here's where things get serious. You hear the word iceberg, and maybe you picture something the size of a house. But in Antarctica, they are colossal, giants made of ice. Some are jagged and monstrous, others eerily smooth. The ones that caught my attention the most were what the locals call tabletop icebergs, flat as a pancake, towering stories above the sea. These weren't just broken bits of frozen water, they were slabs of an ancient ice shelf ripped away and set adrift. When you see one up close, your brain struggles to compute the scale. It's like staring at a floating city block, silent and slowly drifting, indifferent to your awe. Moreover, the one outside Neil's window? It was nothing like that. No craggy crown, no serrated edges. Just smooth, eerily smooth. A glassy white slab floating in silence. From where he sat, eight floors up on the ship, it looked enormous. And here's the kicker. That's just the tip of the iceberg, literally. We've all heard the saying, 90% of an iceberg is underwater. Only 10% show. Do the math, and this thing was probably 72 stories deep. 72. That's deeper than most skyscrapers are tall. And yet, it's just... there. Floating. Naturally, Neil had to know more. He boarded a submersible, yes, a legit submarine, to see it from below. He wanted to witness that hidden 90% proof. But reality hit quickly. Icebergs aren't safe to cozy. They're constantly shifting, melting, tipping, flipping, all to keep that 90% submerged, like a restless giant always trying to find its balance. Are we getting too close? It's way too risky. So, no bottom of the iceberg shot. Disappointing? Sure. But physics is physics. And Neil gets it. Still, the kid in him wanted to see it, to document it, and that curiosity didn't stop there. This trip happened over Christmas, by the way. Picture a tiny submersible, deep in Antarctic waters, with Neil wearing a Santa hat. Why? Science. As you dive, sunlight fades, and red light disappears first. The Santa hat, bright crimson on the surface, started losing its color the deeper they went. Eventually, it turned black. Not because the hat changed.